Amos 5, 18 through 20. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, today, uh, it's kind of a change of plans. Instead of doing our normal Bible study for Friday, or actually we're currently studying the book of Jasher right now on Fridays, but I just felt that God wanted me to... Uh, read to you from Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9 this morning. And it's a picture of great judgment coming, but it's also a picture of hope for those who are the remnant of God. And uh, so we're going to be looking at that alongside Revelation chapter 7 this morning. And my hope and my prayer is that it's actually going to strengthen your faith, strengthen your resolve, uh, give you a greater desire to draw near to God. And so that's kind of my hope for this morning. You know, I honestly believe, and I hope I'm wrong, and I wrote an article up at the uh, website called A Warning for the Coming Fall Months of 2021. And just to keep it short and sweet, uh, I think, I believe, and I have... I've never not believed it. Um, It's just now it's seeming the trends seem to be pointing towards that my thought process was correct. And that is that they're going to bring back all the nonsense, all the nonsense that we dealt with last year. It's all coming back, in my opinion, only this time much worse. And uh, that, I believe, is their plan. And I think you'll see it develop literally in the next 30 to 60 to 90 days. I really do. I hope I'm wrong. And uh, here's the other thing that we need to remember. Just because the enemy has plans to do something doesn't mean they succeed. In fact, the church of, you know, the bride of Christ, we, we have the authority to push these things away. The problem is, is that the church in America has become weak church around the world has become weak, it has become pacified, it has become lukewarm, it has become cowardice, and therefore there's just no power. I mean, if God's people were to just get on their faces, really get on their faces and fast and pray and and pray against the enemy and the evils, and I really think that things could change. Maybe that's what we need to do as a people. We need to pray more. We need to fast more. We need to engage in the war more. And so, anyway, you know, Amos, the reason why you hear me bring this passage up a lot is because it kind of describes what that looks like. You know, he he says, here's what, here's what you can expect. And I write about this in the new book called Faith, Obedience, and the End of Time. If you haven't picked up a copy, please consider doing so. I think you're going to be... It's, it's, it's a lot of truth that's being spoken, really, at the church and at pastors and at, uh, lukewarm Christians. And uh, anyway, I bring this up that if we are living in the last days, then we should expect things to accelerate, like birth pains, like the Bible describes... It would be like one crisis you think is finally coming to an end, right? Like that's kind of been the attitude of the people over the last few months. Oh, this is finally coming to an end. And then boom, it's followed up by another one. Amos says it's like if a man fled from a lion and he met a bear, right? Like, oh, I've got away from the lion and there's the bear. 
where he went in his house and he leaned his hand on the wall. Oh, finally I can rest for a second. And a serpent bit him. Right? That's what you that's what we would expect to see if this is where we are. Now, I want to read to you and look, we could spend the whole day on headlines. We're not going to do that, but the headlines also speak for themselves. I mean, this is just what I've collected in the last couple of days. Let me, let me just read a few of them. I'm not going to read the articles or anything. This apocalyptic drought in the western U.S. is causing unprecedented widespread crop failures on a massive scale. Here's another one. Massive wildfire ravaging Oregon is now the size of Los Angeles and is creating its own weather. Here's another one. Earth and travail. Extreme weather wreaks havoc worldwide, producing record floods, droughts, famines, fires, and plagues. I mean, could it be more obvious what's going on in the world? Uh, I mean, it's time for Christians to really wake up and acknowledge what's going on. It's like, if you remember several years ago, Christians were awake, and they were like, oh, this is, we must be going to, and then everybody went back to sleep. It's almost like the parable of the, the, of the maidens, right? They all fell asleep, and then boom, at midnight, the cry came. And those who had oil in their lamps went in. The other half, who did not prepare, who did not think ahead, who were not ready, did not go in. Let me read Ezekiel chapter 8. And nine, and I want to point out something that I think is encouraging, especially to those of you who are kind of heartbroken about what's going on in the world, who are grieved by the things that you're seeing. Let me just tell you, God sees that as a good thing. Let's start. Now, what I want to read to you is actually in chapter nine, but, you know, text without context is a pretext to make things mean whatever you want. So we're going to read the whole thing. It's actually really, really short. It's only 18 verses for chapter 8 and 11 for chapter 9. So let's just take a look. Here's what it says. King James Bible, Ezekiel 8 through 9. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the, as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth from the form of a hand, and took me by the lock of my head. And then the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven, and he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door and the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Alright, so please note... Ezekiel is describing that he was taken away in the spirit and he's getting ready and he's seeing a vision. Okay. Verse five. Then said he unto me, son of man, lift up thy eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way towards the north and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, that thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked in, behold, a hole in the wall. And then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said to me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and I saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Please note, I think it's interesting. Again, this is during the time of Ezekiel. 
God is showing the the terrible abominations that are taking place behind the scenes. And some of the things he sees are like abom- abominable beast. Now, what are some of the headlines that we've seen recently? Like they're using, they're combining monkey and man, pig and man. I mean, who knows what abominable things they've done behind the scenes, right? Even in this time, these are the things that they are doing. Back even in Ezekiel's day, he says, So I went and I saw and behold every form of creeping things, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed round about him with the wall. Let's continue. Verse 11. And there stood before them seventy men of the agents of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jaazniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in his chamber of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and I shall see greater abomination than these. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations with the, which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. In other words, they bring it upon themselves. Therefore I will also deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So that's chapter 8. God showing Ezekiel all the abominations, all the idolatry, all the wickedness that they're doing. He says, I'm not going to have pity. I'm not even going to hear if they cry with a loud voice. It's coming down on them. Okay? And are we not even worse now? Chapter 9. Here's what I really want to share with you. Let's read chapter 9 real quick here. 11 verses. And he cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them to have charge over the city. Draw near even every man with his destroying weapon in hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, and which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereunto he to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go you after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither ye have pity. Slay utterly old, young, both maids, and little children and women, but come not you near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the ancient men which were in before the house. All right, let's stop. Let's see if you caught on. So in the vision, there's a man who has uh, linen, not clothed with linen. And he has ink, and he has you know an inkhorn in his hands, and he's commanded to go and find the people that cry and sigh for the abominations, right? Like those people who are in the midst of the city, who are just grieved by the evil that's going on, and they're just like, oh, I'm just. Every morning they wake up and they see what's going on. And they're like, oh, I'm just sick of this, and they they're just tormented by the abominations. 
maybe some of you can relate to that. I know I feel that way. I look at the headlines and I'm like, oh, does it ever end? He said, go through and mark these people. Go through and mark them. The ones that are sighing and crying for the abominations that are being done. And then after that, go through the whole city and smite. Like, don't have any pity. Don't spare any. It doesn't matter if they're old, if they're young, if they're maids or if they're children or if they're women. If they don't have the mark of God, then destroy them and start with those in the sanctuary. What does the scripture say? Judgment begins in the house of the Lord, right? This should cause the lukewarm church to tremble. Let's just read the last four verses. But the point that I wanted to point out to you was that part. God sent, sent the angel to, to mark those who sighed and cried about these abominations, who were deeply troubled by what was going on. But everyone else, there was no pity. Verse 7, And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth, and they slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, and I fell upon my face, and I cried, and I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel, and thou pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord see not. And as for me also, my eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded. Now, the reason I wanted to share this with all of you is because it kind of shows God's method and his attitude when he's bringing great judgment out. He takes note of those who are grieved by the evil that's going on. He takes note of those who are grieved by the abominations that are going on to the point where he has the ones marked. And obviously that's a spiritual mark, right? Those that, are belonging to, those that belong to him are marked for protection. The rest are destroyed. It reminded me of what we also see in Revelation chapter 7. Now I'm going to read this too, and I'm going to upset some people within these 17 verses. Because I'm just going to say what I see, okay? What, this, what the scriptures actually say, as opposed to what I see in every single prophecy book, every single prophecy article, every single prophecy magazine is a, is a wrong description of what this is. And I'm not saying I've got it figured out. I'm just saying I do know how to read. Whereas it seems other people skip over this. Uh, and I think it's because they need to hold to their pet doctrines. So let's take a look. Revelation chapter 7, and then I'll explain to you what I'm talking about. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the west, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Please note, this is kind of like the inkhorn, you know, in Ezekiel, the guy has an inkhorn to mark the people. In this instance, this person has a seal to mark the people, the seal of the living God. And he went with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. All right, let's stop for a second, because what we always hear is how there's going to be 144,000 Jews sealed, right? Well, that's not what it says at all. Let me start with verse 3, and then we'll get to verse 4, and I'll explain it even further. Verse 3 doesn't say, go seal all the go seal Jews, right? It says, the servants of God, until we seal the servants of God. Very next verse, verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty 
and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Listen, there was twelve tribes of Israel. One tribe was Judah, where the Jew is a descendant. The Jews only make up one of the twelve tribes of all Israel. The book of Revelation does not say that there was 144,000 Jews sealed like all these prophecy books and prophecy magazines and prophecy articles say. There's actually 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. Now, whether these numbers are literal or figurative, symbolic, I mean, it's up for speculation, right? We can try to say we know for sure, but we don't. Here's what it says. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Ishkar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zubilon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Okay. So we have the four angels. They're holding back the four corners of the earth. They're holding back the winds. And they're holding back this great judgment which is about to be poured out. And then another angel comes crying out saying, don't do this until we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads, right? And then they seal 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. And then it must not just be the tribes of Israel because look at the very next verses, okay? 12,000 of Benjamin were sealed and it goes right into this statement, verse 9, and after this I beheld... And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. How many? Too many to number. I saw a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, of all kindreds, of all people, of all tongues, that stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. So we see the ceiling of the twelve thousand, and then lo, he says, in other words, behold, then I saw this great multitude which I couldn't number, and these people were from everywhere, all nations, right? So we're talking Chinese people, Japanese people, Middle Eastern people, European people, American people, South American people, right? All nations, black people, white people, it doesn't matter. All nations, all kindreds and people, tongues, it doesn't matter what language they're speaking, different tongues. They all stood before the throne before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and salt and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. The picture here is that the angel, they have four angels holding back all this stuff that's about to happen. But before that, the servants of God have to be sealed, and John sees a vision of a multitude that which cannot be numbered, standing before the throne, standing before the Lamb of God, clothed with white robes, with palms in their hands, crying out and saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne. It's a similar idea, isn't it? It's like God's getting ready to wreak havoc and blow this place apart, but not before he. He protects his own. Verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne and about the elders of the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then check this out. And one of the elders answered me, saying, What are these which are arrayed in robes? So one of the elders comes to John and says, Who are these people that you just saw, this great multitude? And whence came they? Like, where did they come from? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which come out of great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. 
And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Now the very next thing that happens after all of this is this, which goes into chapter 8. So you have the sealing and the protection of the, of the 144,000. You have the multitude before the throne of God. And then verse 1 in chapter 8, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. Okay, so when the seventh seal is open, that's when the trumpets go out. Okay? Verse 2, And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. My hope is that you've read, that you've heard this this morning, and you've thought, man, I better get really serious about my relationship with God. Because it's obvious that things are going to continue to go in a spiral, right? Continue to go up in flames. I better draw near to the only one who can and who is willing to preserve me who is willing to save me, not just from all of this turmoil, but save my very soul. Listen, open up your hearts for a second. Let me end by saying this. If there's something that's distracting you from your relationship with God, and it can be a good thing, be a hobby it can be something that's actually beneficial and good for you good for the world good for your family but if it's taking you away from god let me just say this god is about to interrupt that thing if you're a child of god that thing's about to get interrupted because time is short so you can either turn yourself and reprioritize or god's going to interrupt that likewise if there's a sin in your life and you're messing around with that thing you're acting like that foolish servant who said, well, my Lord delayeth. And he goes back to drink with the drunkards. And in other words, he goes back to his sin. Flee from that. Flee from that right now while there's still time. Otherwise, chastisement's coming because God needs to get you right. And it's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel good. Or you run the risk of being like that foolish servant who went back to his sin thinking, oh, the Lord's delayed. And then the Lord came back, right? And caught him off guard. The Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into him and they are saved. We don't need to look at the world and the things going on and tremble with fear. We should be grieved. We should be disturbed by the abominations. We should be grieved for what's going on, but not afraid. Not afraid. We should sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof, like it says in Ezekiel. Well, I don't know if this message made any sense for any of you this morning. I pray that it did in the powerful name of Jesus. Listen, if you picked up the book, number one, thank you for doing so. And number two, if you have the time to go back into Amazon and just give it a five-star rating and uh, maybe a short sentence um, of a review, that would be f super helpful for me. Also, th those of you who support the podcast and make this possible every week, thank you so much. Honestly, I don't know what I would do without you guys. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to, to, to have the privilege to do this work, and I'm just grateful that there's some of you out there who are willing to bless the work that's being done here uh, so thank you lord willing i'll be back with you next week with our normal studies peace and grace be with all of you and until next time